Hi, my name is Ziazan, and I am probably the last student of an ancient singing school dating back almost 400 years. I've set up this channel to preserve what is left of it before it is lost forever. <laughs> Now, when I say that I'm the last student, I mean that I'm the last who hasn't abandoned it for a new sound. Singing classical music changed dramatically in the 20th century. New styles and new techniques came in, and there were fewer and fewer students wanting to learn the old way of singing. Many that did learn later on adopted a more modern style and technique because it was getting harder and harder to get any work sounding old-fashioned. Can you blame them for wanting to be employable? So is there anyone still teaching it? Not really. The technique was fundamentally different from what is being taught today. And let's face it, there's still the problem that if you sing like that, you're not going to get a kick. My teacher was Ray Woodland. Ray taught me the foundations of this technique, which I now believe have remained unchanged for hundreds of years. Style changed, and yes, some stylistic fashions had an impact on technique, which led to many complaints that singing was becoming a lost art, or that it was already a lost art. But I don't think it is yet completely lost, because although it was passed down through oral tradition, there were some teachers who wrote some of it down, so it wouldn't be forgotten if that line was broken. And then when sound recording was invented, there were singers who left us audio examples. Thanks to these written and aural records, I have been able to trace how the technique and style developed over the centuries. By working backwards with the earliest records as a starting point, we can reconstruct how they sang in the 19th, 18th, and possibly even 17th centuries. I believe my approach is unique because the early recordings have long been dismissed as useless in the study of historic singing. There are two reasons for this. Firstly, they don't sound so great, so people think we can't get an idea of the true quality of the voices. But are they really that bad? Or are they just being played on the wrong devices? Most people never get the opportunity to hear a gramophone like this. This is an EMG, named after its inventor, Mr. Ellis Michael Jim. When this baby came along, it was clear that the first records had actually captured a lot of detail. It just took the playback technology a few years to catch up with the recording. This machine gives the impression that the singer is standing in the room with you, about where I am now. I wish you could hear it for yourself, but as the next best thing, I'm going to be making the very best and clearest transcripts that I can from this very gramophone to share with you. Secondly, there is the belief that the first recorded singers were using the same technique as the opera singers of today, and are not in fact a much older technique that is completely unrelated. This comes from an oft-repeated myth that the modern classical singing method began in the 19th century with the great vocal pedagogue Manuel Garcia II. What, what are, they are they saying, saying about, about me? me? Maestro Garcia! Is it really you? It is I. I have come to right the wrongs done to my name. When I was alive, they misunderstood my description of the coup de glotte, and some singers claimed I had ruined their voices with its use. Are they still confused about that? Actually, this time it's something else. Um, yes, they still don't get the coup de glotte. But <gasps> opera singers nowadays constantly keep their larynxes lowered to produce a dark tone, and they say that you were the first to suggest it in 1840. Lies, all lies! Who are these singers? Who said that? Everybody. The earliest I've traced it to is a paper published in 1981, which is frankly just pure fiction. But it looks like everybody is citing each other without going back to read what you actually wrote. To give you an idea of the level of scholarship we're dealing with, some of them even attribute it to your father because they can't be bothered to look you up on Wikipedia. It's just like the coup de glotte debacle all over again. 
I never told them to cluck like a chicken. I told them to quack like a duck. What? And I never condoned keeping the larynx constantly lowered. When I invented the laryngoscope, I observed that the larynx moves up and down freely to produce different timbres, which are essential to give variety and life to a vocal performance. No, if they'd read any of my writings, they would know that I was trying to preserve the 18th century teachings that were passed on to me by my father. My students continued to teach it, but already by the end of my lifetime... Singing had become as much a lost art as the manufacture of Mandarin china or the varnish used by the old masters. Can you tell us what good singing should be, then? If we are talking merely about a vocalization, then I will say firstly, perfect intonation. Secondly, equality of note value. Thirdly, equality of strength. Fourthly, equality of degree of legato. And fifthly, Harmony of timbres. But music, though the language of the emotions, can only arouse them in a vague and general manner. To express any particular feeling or idea, we must make use of words. Hence the importance for the singer of delivering these with the utmost distinctness, correctness and meaning, under the penalty of losing the attention of the audience. Hmm? How do you make words effective? The accent of truth apparent in the voice when speaking naturally is the basis of expression in singing. The imitation of instinctive impulse therefore must be studied. How do we practice imitating instinctive impulse, though? A powerful means of exciting the mind to a vivid conception of the subject is to imagine the personage as standing before one and let the phantom sing and act, criticising closely both efforts, then, when satisfied with the results, to imitate them exactly. Hmm, I'm not sure I'd be good at that. But how does a singer transmit emotions to an audience? By feeling strongly himself. Or herself. Sympathy is the sole transmitter of emotion, and the feelings of an audience are excited by our own, as the vibrations of one instrument are awakened by the vibrations of another. Can I play you some examples of modern singing, and will you tell me what you think? If you must. <clears throat> okay, this is how opera is expected to sound today. Maestro? Has it stopped? Oof. This is not singing, these ugly sounds. They are out of tune, not disguised by the excessive and nauseating vibrato. There is no hope of hearing the words because they are restricting the flow of sound in the throat. Well, that's now the established way of singing the music of the 19th and 20th centuries, the canon. This is how they're singing music written before 1800. Oh. That's no better. Why do they howl the high notes? And what is that guttural sound they are making? Uh. I think that's meant to be a trill. Mm. But this is considered unacceptable today. This is more like it. The tone emission is natural and steady, 
They are not squeezing out the voice. The legato joins every note to another, and they are evoking the appropriate dramatic feeling. I agree, but if anyone tried to sing like that today, they would be laughed off the stage. How did we get to this point? In the second half of the 20th century, there was a movement called the Early Music Revival. The idea was to perform forgotten historic music, but also to bring back historic instruments such as the harpsichord, which had fallen out of fashion with the advent of the pianoforte. Also, there was the move to play well-known historic music on those old instruments, such as we should be playing Bach on a harpsichord rather than a piano. Meanwhile, singers claimed to have rediscovered the historic sound, different to the conventional singing of the time, which sounded like this. So the early music singers came up with this. They are both wrong. This is more like it. Hear the rubato. I do. I'll have to make a video on rubato later because that has been forgotten. But back to the early music movement. This new sound captured the public imagination and quite quickly became the established method of singing pre-1800 music, eventually becoming an unquestionable orthodoxy. I offered a paper to a conference that took place online recently called Early Music in the 21st Century. Their website states, it is time to rethink, reevaluate, and reboot the early music movement. Early music in the 21st century hopes to create confrontational and revolutionary results. So I offered them a musical revolution. I said it's time to launch the historically informed singing movement we only thought we had. I pointed out that as well as ignoring the early records, thinking those singers were using a more modern technique. Which I supposedly invented. The early music pioneers also missed the fact that there were still teachers trained in the historic tradition who were willing to pass it on. They ignored them and went off and did their own thing. Hmm. And now the last bel canto teachers are gone. And how was your paper received at the conference? Oh, they rejected it. Do not be disheartened. You must succeed. There will always be audiences for good singing. You must find them. That's why I set up this channel. YouTube? That's it? That's... that's your plan? Yeah, I can reach loads more people here than in any conference. You never know who might stumble across my videos. What, you don't think it's going to work? No, I didn't say that. You look like you. I am grateful that through your efforts I will not be misunderstood again. You are presenting the facts on the internet, where they cannot be misinterpreted. I am confident I can place my trust in you. Good luck to you, Suzanne. It's the... We are all counting on you. All? Who's we? Who's counting? The phantoms of the opera. There are more? Are they going to visit me too? Will I see you again? Don't let us down.
Only you can save the canto now. Maestro, wait! Well, I guess that's all for today. If you want to take part in the restoration of Bel Canto, hit the subscribe button below and come find me on Instagram and Twitter at Opera Phantoms. I'm also setting up a Patreon, so if you have any suggestions for the kind of bonus content you would like to see there, let me know in the comments below. I'll be back here soon to share with you more secrets of Bel Canto, its history, and hopefully its future. I hope you'll join me again, won't you? Thank you.